Okay. Thank you. Um, do we have a public comment to start with? We haven't been assigning a timekeeper. Um, we do have a first public comment on our agenda. Please unmute, or if you called in, um, use star six to unmute and share who you are if you called in in order to ask a question or provide a comment. Hello, this is Tammy. What time did the meeting come to order? The meeting came to order at 6 p.m. I'm sorry, Tammy. That's all right. Thank you. Okay. Hearing no other um, public comment, I'd like to move forward um, to the consent agenda. It includes approving the minutes of Tuesday, January 19th. Um, from our regular meeting and then Monday, January 25th, a special meeting that we held. Is everybody able to see those minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Um, um, January 19th and January 25th. Thank you, Andrew. I'll second it. Okay. Is there any discussion of the minutes of January 19th regular meeting and January 25th, our special meeting? Okay, all in favor of approving those minutes, please say aye. 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 Lisa? Aye. Sorry, I couldn't get that. <laughs> I know. Sometimes it takes a minute. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, and the minutes are approved. There are no nays um, and no one to abstain. Thank you. That brings us to um, our section for board comments. Do we have any board comments? Anything anyone would like to share? Um, I guess I would just say, I mean, we went through the budget uh, stuff, and uh, but again, you know, I just say thank you to all the faculty and staff at each of the campuses and the administrators, everyone for for the work you're doing this year and, and the work you did for for the budget that we put together. And uh, I think everyone on the board, you know, I don't think we could ever say how much we appreciate all the work that everyone does. So, uh, so thanks again. Yeah, thank you. You're here. Thank you. And this is Lisa. I'm wondering if there are any candidates running for the board seat in Royalton. <coughs> anything that we can do to, uh, if there are, to get to circulate those names or that name for write in ballots? Yeah, I haven't heard any. Um, I'm wondering if Chris or Andrew or Bob have. No, I haven't. I haven't. I, sp I spoke to several people, but not, but they're not interested. Is that something that we could maybe make more public on, say, the Royalton Facebook page? Is it Royalton Speaks? Um, just so that people are aware, and what and how many write-in votes are needed, and all of that. I think. I mean, I'm happy to, to get those conversations going, but it might be more influential if somebody from Royalton is doing is posting that. Yeah, I can post something. Thank you, Andrew. Great. That's a great idea. Bob, did you launch your campaign? What? Did you launch your campaign? Is that what I just, I thought that's what you were getting ready to say. No. No. All right, thank you. Any further board board comments? I'd like to thank Jamie and and um I know I'm going off the board, but I think he came into a really difficult situation. 
and uh, he's handled it very, very well. And uh, he started with a zero based budget and he managed to put together a budget that included teacher raises and benefit raises uh, at the same time, decrease the budget. Um, you know, it's a lot of work um, and a difficult job. And I, I just think you've done a great job. Jimmy. Well, thanks. I want to thank the admin team. They, they've been great. Everyone's been great. So thank everybody. It's been a complete team effort, faculty, staff, admin, um, board has been unbelievably supportive to the ideas we've proposed. So just thank thank all of you. Thanks, Bob. Wonderful, thank you. Um, moving on, any any other board comment before we move on to the superintendent's report? All right. Um, is there a way that we can drop the um, reports document into the chat? I was thinking about this um, a few minutes ago, just so that people who are following along might be able to access those a little more easily. Perfect, thank you. All right, I'll turn things over to Jamie. Uh, good evening. Um, the uh, the last, you know, the last week has been um, trying for certainly the, the COVID response team. I got to put a shout out there to that team, uh, Shane and Reed um, and Susan, and then the support of the other uh, Rudd principals and uh, Danielle Isham, our nurse, I know has, you know, you know, offered to assist. And it's been a real team effort in our teacher's ability to adjust on the fly. Um, I'm really proud of the decision we made to hit the pause button for a week and we'll talk to you about what information goes into those decision making metrics here in a little bit on the agenda. I added that to the agenda to talk to you about the system that we put in place around procedures. Um, you know, I, I stand behind um, the mitigation risk that, you know, that mitigation uh, procedures and protocols we have in place to decrease risk. But as we've always said, it's to mitigate risk. It's not to take all risk out. Um, and with these things, it's really hard um, to put your finger on whether or not COVID was transmitted necessarily in our building and or our bus or outside of our buildings and buses. Um, what we do know is that we have positive RUD community members. Um, and so I know that team's been working tirelessly since um, last uh, Wednesday evening. Uh, we got the information at about 5.30. I got a call from Shane and we were able to communicate with the community um, by 6.30. And so uh, they've been working nonstop since. I know no one got a break over the weekend because uh, I could see all the work happening around contact tracing. So I just, I wanted to put a shout out to them. Um, some other things to just know, a reminder, um, that our two finalists for the chief academic officer position are going to be interviewing with me on Thursday. And then we have community drop-ins um, to ask questions and get to know about the two candidates. We'll also be sharing a form that folks can complete and provide feedback on the two candidates. That information then will be used also in regards to the interviews they have with me and reference checks for me to forward a finalist to the full SU board next Monday um, for hopefully um, approval. So for an interview with the, the full board and, and hopefully uh, an approval of a candidate. I um, We had five candidates that the search committee interviewed, all really highly qualified candidates, and I'm looking forward to meeting with our two finalists on Thursday afternoon. Um, and so that's, that's good news and um, you know, we continue to work diligently on our uh, federal grants um, and our, our COVID relief grants um, and our ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 grants. The other big thing that's on the horizon um, is that uh, we have to put together a plan 
um, to deal with regression um, and our response to regression. And so that plan is in the works and we will need to get that to the AOE soon. I'm still waiting on some additional guidance, what has to be all part of the plan. And then also I'm meeting with SU principals, uh, Don McMahon and Kerry uh, McDonald on Thursday morning to discuss how we're gonna approach summer programming with a focus on addressing regression and gap filling. Um, and so that's happening this week as well. And I'll take any questions folks have. Right. I'm not hearing any questions. Thank you for I all. Have, okay, thanks, one. Bob. Yeah. Great. So, Jamie, I, I, heard, uh, I heard you say that we're going to open the sports season. Yeah, the goal is right now, tentatively, we're looking at Saturday um, as an opportunity for us to get back um, on the courts um, and in the bowling um, arena. So that's still the tentative date as of right now. Yeah. We also did recommend that athletes go ahead and get tested. Um, and so I'm hoping that folks will take us up on that recommendation and that our athletes go ahead and, and receive a negative test just to ensure as we do reopen that we don't have any issues with staying open for um, athletic and activities. Are there schedules? Are there schedules now that have been put together? Yeah, Reed, you wanna to speak to that? Yes, the, the schedules were made for the season once the governor gave us the green light for that to happen. Uh, and uh, that's two games a week. And so when we when we close and we can't, we don't try to reschedule them. We just will finish up the existing schedule. So this is going to reduce the total number of games, but uh, we're optimistic we can get a couple of games in. What? I'm just curious, Reed. What? How many basketball games are scheduled right now? Uh, how many would be left for the rest of the season? Uh, I think we'd be looking at six. I think that's accurate. Yeah, six. I think that'd be six for the girls varsity, six for the boys varsity. Uh, we didn't plan to have any middle school games because of, of COVID and the risk. Uh, L and a lot of our, uh, you know, uh, competitive sister schools uh, are having trouble fielding JV teams right now. Uh, so we we may only end up with two JV games, is how it looks right now. But the numbers on the the squad itself may make that impossible for us to to field enough kids on both a varsity and JV game. The kids will end up playing both games for. Uh, you know, they can play up to six quarters a day. Yep, definitely an abbreviated season for sure. Is there some kind of playoff at the end or is it just the six games? Yes, they are planning for playoffs. So you could add those on. Yeah. Right. Are there other questions? We can always cycle back if you think of something. Um, so we will move on now to the principal's report. Again, um, organized by the goals that we discussed at our informational meeting previously. We didn't talk about who was going to talk during this because we planned for the budget presentation. <laughs> and I'm seeing like reparative practices is misspelled. <laughs> when did we put it in like that on purpose or was it a misprint? Uh, yeah, I think you can just read through. Andrew, I want to thank you for pointing out my mistake. <laughs> reparative. I, I made that mistake and the person that finds it gets a free love chocolate bar. <laughs> <laughs> 
Congratulations, Andrew. <laughs> we address our, three, we address our three goals, and like each month, we update it. And some of it moved from introducing some parts, like flex, a more uh, focused, flexible pathways model with the middle and high school, to really now start building it. But there's a lot of good stuff in there. And uh, if you want any highlights on it, I'm happy to give it. But I think it's probably self-explanatory. Yeah, there is a lot of good stuff in there, including links to the new um, high school newspaper, which I was excited to read. Um, so if you haven't taken a look, I know it was shared in the chat earlier, um, but if you haven't taken a look at these reports, there are goodies linked in so um i always appreciate that one one item that's not in the principal's report that uh, we wanted to, to bring before you tonight uh, is the matter of high school graduation uh, as of as of this moment there is nothing from the state about graduation so it it looks like we'll probably go down into the first or second week in may before it's clear what is or is not possible for that. Um, my uh, high school colleagues are planning for uh, everything from completely virtual graduation ceremonies to uh, you know being able to have some type of masked, physically distanced, uh, in-person graduation ceremonies. Um, although it seems like some of them are talking about you know dividing their larger schools into cohorts to make that happen. Uh, the, the piece that we would ask for your input on tonight is that uh, the graduation ceremony itself has been scheduled for the, the second Saturday in June, as it's always been at 10 a.m. Um, but now that we've had two snow days, uh, the school year itself will extend past that graduation date. Uh, our, our recommendation would be to leave it where it is. Uh, the seniors will be fine. Uh, graduating on June 12th and being done, uh, but it is a possibility of moving it back a Saturday so that it, it doesn't happen until after the new last day of school. Can I add one more thing, Lisa? Of course. Um, <clears throat> in the chat is a link to an article about outdoor education and using outdoor education in the pandemic. And it's with a, um, it's a woman from Waterbury wrote it and it's being in this um, platform called Medium, which was started by one of the um, folks that started Twitter. It's an online magazine and several schools are highlighted, but White River Valley Middle School is clearly a focus in there. And we have tons of photos in there. Really proud of that. That came out today. That's why I'm just pushing it out. All right, thank you. Yeah. I can't wait to read it. Okay. Um, Reed, in terms of a decision about graduation, do you need us, like, is that something you'd like action on sooner rather than later? Do you have a recommendation for one of those two things? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend that we keep it as it is, unless anybody, any among you, feel like we should do something differently. I don't. I don't really see a reason we need to change it, but wanted to let you have the opportunity, you know, ultimately your call. I think this school year has been hard enough for seniors. If families are already planning on a June 12th graduation date, I think your recommendation is reasonable and humane. <laughs> Other thoughts about that? I agree. Yeah, I, I agree. Do we do we need to formally vote, or you guys know what we what we think? And it, it's been recorded. You know, every district does this a little different. I I think you can absolutely take action and do it, or you can just you know, we just were looking for your have, guidance. I'll move that we have uh, graduation on June. Is it June twelfth, Lisa? Yes. June At ten a.m. Yep. Ten a.m. All right. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Okay. Lisa, Lisa beat you to it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> any discussion? Okay. 
All in favor of keeping June 12th at 10 a.m. as uh, the date and time for our 2021 graduation, please say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. So Thank June, you June 12th, 10 a.m. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions of the principal's report? All right. We'll move along into the Virtual Learning Academy report. Lindy? Absolutely. So um, my report, I believe, went out with others. Um, and so just kind of as an update right now, or as of last Thursday, and I believe it's still true to this day, there's 111 students that are enrolled in grades K through eight in our virtual learning academy. We are approaching the third trimester, believe it or not, in middle of March. So a letter will go out shortly asking families if they would like to transition back to in-person learning, that's their opportunity to do so. Um, I have been working with building principles to address any students that were concerned about engagement um, or struggling for a wide variety of reasons. You know, this can present a lot of issues of social isolation. If you're following the governor's orders of no multi-household uh, gatherings at this time, uh, lack of engagement, frequent absences, we try to push those folks with the support of their family and um, teachers and students back to in-person as soon as possible. Um, so we don't wait for that deadline. It's the other way to look at that. Um, the month of January and the first week of February, just like in-person students, all the virtual academy students completed um, assessments, including the PNOA, FMP benchmark, and STAR 360 testing. Um, we're starting to organize some of that and look at it just as a faculty, and we'll present out the results. But we're also going to share it, you know, in with home schools so they know where all their students are, because eventually the plan is that everybody's learning in person, hopefully. Um, and I did wanna highlight just a couple of things. Uh, the sixth grade virtual um, academy teacher of math offered this great opportunity for students to participate in this virtual statewide math fair. And there's actually three students who jumped right on that to do that. And um, so that's great to see. That'll actually be in April, and I'm still trying to fully understand what that encompasses, but the kids and she seem to have a great read on it. And then um, our second and third grade students have been learning about ecosystems, and they even made their own habitat or did a food chain. And they've been working with some programming from the Eco Center. And next up, it kind of comes in two-week increments. They'll be learning about adaptation and making their own organisms and there's a couple of examples there. And then um, a lot of schools invited kids from the Virtual Learning Academy to join in with like morning meeting or other aspects of their day when the whole SU was remote that week in January, which I think was a great opportunity. And that's where we're at with Virtual Academy. Thank you for that. Any questions or comments about Lindy's report? Lindy, what's uh, what's your uh, what's your assessment of how it how it's gone for the year? How are how are the students doing academically? Um, I think we're starting to hit some fatigue. If I'm honest, we're almost a year into virtual learning. If you're a household who has chosen to do this again this year. And I think we're, what I'm hearing from teachers and some families is we're all kind of looking for new and exciting ways to keep kids engaged. They go through a little bit of a roller coaster, especially, um, you know, we're indoors more as a group of people and there's not as many offerings outside socially that kids can participate in. So I do think there's a little bit of like, oh, are you gonna make me learn on the computer again today? Um, which, which is a fair assessment at this point. Like I said, we're almost a year into this. Um, I think teachers have been working with families. Families have been great about reaching out and saying, uh, we've hit a wall, we need some help. So we've had a lot of those conversations. Overall, um, there's always things we can do better. 
like if we were starting from scratch again, I would do like a, a orientation or an intro to what it takes to learn virtually in grade one and grade two and grade three. Um, I also, one thing we're going to talk about at the Virtual Learning Academy faculty tomorrow, because Wednesdays are our faculty meeting days, is getting some more intervention services for some kiddos that are struggling academically. Um, and just that extra repetition of time and how that could help them succeed and make some more growth. Because while a lot of this is very dependent on how much support there is at home. Lindy, do you have any, any recommendations? If you were to do it again, you know. Mm -hmm. I think uh, recommendations, if I could do it again, and I had an unlimited budget and an unlimited staff. I'm gonna put those preferences out there because I know everybody is stretched thin to make this happen, is I would say, it'd be um, beneficial to have a special ed case manager that's just assigned to the entire virtual learning community because we're really trying to juggle quite a few schedules to make make certain every kid is getting their services that needs it. Um, I would also say I think we need to be much more particular or specific about you can't just sign up to participate in the Virtual Learning Academy. I know that um, up until this point, and you know, Stockford Rochester went through exactly what you guys are going through now with COVID before Christmas vacation. But up until this point, we've done really well with in-person learning. And we just know that that's successful. I understand folks' concerns, but I'd like to see more and more folks, um, kiddos coming back to in-person learning and just, if it's not successful at this point for your kiddo, then it, we really have to have a real conversation about whether you should be able to come back in if we're doing this moving forward because just hindering their success and what we can help manage in person that we can't virtually all the time. Um, and same with having like an interventionist just assigned to Virtual Learning Academy. I think. Folks are, like I said, just stretched thin. We're all trying to close gaps as quickly as possible. And uh, there's needs everywhere. And I know this question wasn't for me, but I do also want to weigh in because I feel like I get to dabble in both worlds when we go virtual or when we plan to go virtual or when we just get to do it. But I, I think our teachers have done such an amazing job like on the fly, putting together the Google Classroom and all these things. but. I think what could be hard for a parent is my kid's third grade Google Classroom looks different than my first grade kid's Google Classroom because we didn't have enough time for teachers to really sit with each other, have some great PD around this. It was like trial by fire, like quick, hurry, put it together. Um, so if I was to be in charge of the world and do this again, we have a lot more learning opportunities for teachers ahead of time. And we've grown so much just, you know, because we had to. Um, but I think that ease of access maybe isn't always there for some parents just because of the way we had to put things together in a quick manner. Right. And then the last piece I would just say is socially, really worried about kids socially. They are craving more social time. That's what every teacher has reported out to me that it's like, okay, guys, you have to go to your next thing or do, your, and, and they don't want to get off because it's the only time they're getting to interact with other kiddos. And, um, so we're providing those supports in doing that, but that's those are kind of all things. There's this nice running list that we talk about as a staff every week. Like if we could do this all over again, what do we need to keep in mind? And those are things and um, that are there. And I would also say the focus is on literacy and mathematics, but there's kids who need more and they need more science opportunities. They need more um, social studies opportunities and, uh, just making sure that we make that that's a point of emphasis and is built into the plan as well. Thanks, Linda. You're welcome. On the, on the social front, um, today was the day that the Royalton and Bethel kids were supposed to be with uh, their homeschool um, classes, um, and that got snowed out. So if we could reschedule that, that'd be great. I know Absolutely. we're going to get to the forefront. I know. It's spirit week kind of got poo-pooed on the snow day. <laughs>
Do you guys ever try to have like a virtual recess or a game time? Okay. I, they've done like lunch bunches is what I would call it, where different teachers or paraeducators are offering time for them to just be there. And there's an adult um, monitoring how we're using technology in the Google yeah. meeting is the way I'm going to word that. Yeah. Uh, but the kids get to be kids and socialize. I just think, uh, like I said earlier, you know, winter makes it harder. And because they can't gather outside of this, it's getting tougher and tougher for kiddos. On a more positive note, Andrew, some of the kids are still connecting tomorrow because tomorrow is not going to be a snow day, right? <laughs> yeah, no, this was just them getting to, um, you know, go in with their uh, home schools, right, home Andrew? School. They were going to join for yeah. Yep, I, I'm uh, my third grader at Royalton is connecting with okay. Bethel Oops. campus. Um, so you were focusing on VLA. Is that correct, Andrew? Yeah. So it's just okay. a little Sorry different. about that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Now I got it. I apologize. Thanks. It's exciting, though, that those connections are happening. Right. I do think it's cool that kids have extended their friend network because they've all been put together um, virtually. And it, it happened organically. Even if it was through a computer screen, they've made friends with some kiddos they may not interact with with high school. And I do think as many elementary schools that have school choice, uh, seven through 12, hopefully that's a benefit or an attraction that they have some friends in some other buildings and maybe direct some kids towards Bethel and Royalton in the future. Oh, thank you. All right, other this, questions? Yeah, yeah. Go for it, um, so this might be more for Jamie, but uh, I know, <laughs> You know, the governor has, you know, made different sort of, you know, he said like he'd like to see all kids return to in-face by like, I think it's moved a couple times, but now I think it's like April. Uh, I mean, where do we see, you know, sort of on the ground things, you know, the progression? I mean, I think right now, you know, I think, you know, I'm, I'm guessing his goalposts will continue to move and it'll depend on, uh, on you know, vaccine rollouts and availability and things like that. But I mean, what do you all see for it? Are you saying when I would expect um, all students to return and not offer a VLA, Chris? Right. Uh, well, I, I've i committed that we would do it the rest of the year. I've told staff that for predictability. And, um, and so I was not intending to not have VLA operating. Um, the Winooski Valley Soups, we've talked a lot about the importance of uh, maybe a regional approach with this. So we had all commit, committed that we would continue with our virtual learning academies for this year and then look to come back to in-person for next fall is the goal. Um, and so, you know, what I think our, what I'm projecting is, is that we would be fully in person next fall, um, but also offer pathways and things, of course, because um, even prior to COVID, some students, especially at middle high school, um, might access a, a big chunk of their learning via virtual means. Um, and so that we would still offer, but um, we would look to have students back in person next fall. Thank you for that. Any other questions related to the Virtual Learning Academy before we move on to our business manager's report? Right. I'm not seeing any. So Tara, um, it's all yours. Good evening, everyone. You have my report. Ray, if you want to project the revenue and expenditure summary, I can go over that with you all. So uh, at the finance committee level, they had requested that I add a column into the summary that shows what was in there last month versus what I'm projecting for this month so you can see the differences. So you'll see there on the revenue side that I have changed the tuition projection from $643,166 to $622,073. And that is a result of a student moving back into the district that will no longer be tuitioned. And we have another student that we've been notified um, that's not a tuition student. So that's the two changes there. 
And then I've updated, Ray, if you could scroll down just a little bit further. The other update there is the COVID reimbursement to match the expenditure side. And you can see we're still projecting a surplus for the current fiscal year of $173,290. Ray, if you could go to the second page and I can go over the expenditure changes, please. Thank you. So there is where the COVID costs have been updated from the 172,290 to the 203,171. And then I have added in on um, review of the expenditure report that it looks like we've got some projected savings under our equipment line of $8,500. So that's been added in there too. And those are the only two changes that I made for the month of January. So if there's any questions. Chris? Let's try, try out the raise hand feature. Uh, so just clarification on the tuition students, how does the tuition work? Does it, is it just based on like where the students in the year at, or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more used to like, I guess the college sort of financial structure where you pay by the semester. So, I mean, you know, if a student is out, you know, if they're a tuition student for the first half of the year, but then say they move into the district, is it just that, you know, that there's no you know, payment for the first half of the year then, or, and it all goes away or, or, or how does that work? I guess. The tuition is prorated based on the date that they enroll or disenroll okay. or unenroll. So you all do just sort of like a back calculation, you know, so, yep. yeah. we do bill out two semesters. So we bill first semester and second semester. And then if there's any changes made within that semester, we adjust the tuition as we've been notified. Okay. And so is that 35,000? Is that based on the, you know, you know, the bill back stuff, or is that just based on, you know, a, a full tuition value of a student, you know, or, or what it is per pupil cost? There is um, a, stu a few students we don't have residency verification on, so there's still some students that aren't counted there. And then the student moving out wasn't, wasn't very long into the, se this, the school year that they moved into the district, so we'll have to credit back the school for the tuition okay. that they paid for that difference. And then the other one was taking out the full cost of the student because they're not a tuition student. Cool, thank you. All right, other questions for Tara? No? Thank you, and thank you for adding that additional column and all the work you've done on the budget. You're welcome. Hi. Um, that brings us to a report from our facilities committee. So we've had uh, two meetings uh, at this point um, where we've, we've uh, been looking at building priorities for the two campuses. Um, don't have a, a big full report for you tonight, but uh, we're trying to trying to assess what might be needed in both buildings in the three to five year horizon, so we can have a kind of shovel ready list uh, for when there's some federal infrastructure money, hopefully in the, the next couple months, uh, to get some of those projects uh, going. Uh, along with that, uh, Chris has has been really engaged in some of the conservation work. Chris, I don't know if you want to talk about what you've been, been looking at a little more deeply. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, one of the things, you know, when you're looking at energy usage and buildings and stuff, it's always good to go and look at the electric bills. Uh, so, uh, so Reed uh, uh, and the people, I believe, at the business office were able to get together the uh, I don't know if it's like the past year's worth of electric bills. I haven't <laughs> haven't gotten too far through them yet, but uh, I guess I got far enough. I mean, you just look for things that that are different from from year to year and month to month, and and you know, hopefully get to the point where you know you start to get familiar with it enough that you can start saying, okay, well, what happened? You know, what changed from last month to this month or whatever? Uh, so, you know, started looking at that. You know, we maybe caught something already uh, with. Uh, Looks like lights at the baseball field in Bethel, uh, potentially. 
they've been it looks like they've been maybe on for the last three months or something there's uh there's been a bill for those uh baseball field lights these last three months when normally there isn't any bill in the winter time uh for baseball field lights and the in the amount of electrical usage way exceeds what we would typically see like in the summertime uh or when when the fields might be being used for sports so uh it's like four to five hundred bucks a month uh is what the current bill is coming in at uh, for the last three months so uh so you know small things like that where it might just be something that's on and just need to flip a switch uh you know and and you see that in buildings a lot where things change and something just goes to like a default on position and then you start pulling more electricity so uh and you know we'll keep looking at it you know looking around just at the the campus bills and trying to get familiar with them and and seeing what the what the rates like and at the campus level you know getting familiar with like the rate structures and stuff because we pay you know residentially we're used to paying for our kilowatt hours of usage uh, but here you know for commercial scale we pay for our our kilowatts of demand also so like what's your instantaneous draw on the grid and basically what we pay for in terms of demand charges is about equivalent to what we pay for for like our just energy usage so you know those instantaneous demands equal to about you know 50 percent of our bill so you know if there's things that we can do to reduce demand that's going to save energy both in kilowatt hours but also in kw and we've been talking about other ways that we might be able to engage students in uh, some energy yeah. conservation projects around the school um, looking at the environment and virathon group and the uh, science science of, is it? it's not the science of thon uh, but some of the the groups on campus including the environmental science class that they could pick that up um, what we're seeing at the high school level is that that there's not as much uh, engagement with students in the extracurricular activities like that that we do have so our numbers are down to uh, with a couple exceptions we we may not be able to pull that together this spring but certainly would would look to it in the fall um, and you know kind of projecting where we'll be forward forward hopefully two or two months from now we'll be able to come forward with a, a report saying these are our our facilities priorities for the board to review and approve uh as we move forward that that might be a little optimistic that we'll get there that quickly but um before the end of the year certainly yeah yeah it would be nice yeah at the school levels yeah if there can be some sort of like you know student and teacher and staff involvement you know and have like you know an energy committee or have a club uh, mm -hmm. uh i was talking about a couple of years ago i remember when dalton gomez was still uh, a teacher in royalton uh he had like an environmental science group that was looking at some different energy uh efficiency things and they actually had come up to vermont tech one time and and visited and talked about some stuff like you know trying to come up with an idea for like a wall for that breezeway area by the gym to put up in the winter time and help help cut down on the amount of cold air coming into the buildings uh, when those doors are in use and stuff. So, you know, yeah, if we can make it educational and interactive for, for the students and everyone else in the building, you know, that goes a long way to help uh, with, you know, energy conservation. And engages our students, that's awesome. All right. Thank you for that. Any other questions for our facilities committee? I'm still trying to figure out what the lights at the Bethel ball field are all about. Cause I don't think that's been a thing my whole life. Uh, I, think, I think what you're thinking is because it was used as a staging area for some of the, the town construction that maybe they got turned on by the town and never got shut off, but okay. that's preliminary. Yeah. And we'll get to the bottom of it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, yeah, and luckily it comes on a separate bill from the rest of the school or else you would never know. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Well, thank you for catching that. <clears throat> okay. So that brings us to our um, review and discussion of the informational meeting. So are there I, put this on, I put this on there just to see if you guys want to discuss any adjustments in your approach or anything. Um, so. 
thought it went fairly well. Um, it'll be smoother next time. But anything we should add or, you know, I think going over the warrant um, maybe earlier in the meeting would be better. And remembering introductions up front. Yeah, yeah, I would suggest yeah, remembering remembering the introductions first. <laughs> we seem to forget that every year, uh, and then uh, and then yeah, I would suggest maybe do the warrant second after the introductions, and then go into the uh, the more informational piece last potentially. I don't know if that's how we originally envisioned it, but uh, it might make sense since like the the. The total cost, you know, the approval for the for the budget, you know, is like one of either the last or second to last article. And so then doing the presentation after that might make the most sense. Well, I think what might make sense is, is we do the presentation and then show the ballot at the very end. Because like it was kind of abrupt at the end anyway, like when I finished talking about the taxes and then we just kind of stop. So having like, here's the ballot, this is how you vote at the very end. And do we have the questions or something? Yeah. What if we have the ballot at the beginning and the end? Because sometimes people leave early and then we'll make sure that everybody gets exposed to it. I mean, and just recognizing that this is new, that sure. we're not having, you know, just to, we're not having a town meeting. This is what's happening. This is what's going to be on your ballot when you go in to vote. Um, this is what, how you're going to see it. Normally we would have done this on the floor. Just that kind of a description to make people like, say, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. But I think also an opportunity at some point to have any candidates that are wanting to be written in to have an opportunity to introduce themselves or if they're not able to be there, if we have anybody that, you know, any names we want to share so that people can go and vote and write those names in. Again, the 30 name minimum to be considered, et cetera. Um, and hopefully that'll be, you know, we'll know all the names by the time the 1st of March comes along because voting will be the next day, but it'd be great to have that somewhere in the, in the agenda. Thank you, Ray. I just want to make sure that I can share the slides. You talked about the video, but I want to make sure that it's okay to share the slides as well. The presentation slides like on Facebook or front porch forum, in addition to the video from tonight's meeting. Yes. I, yep. I feel comfortable with that. Great. Yeah. And then I don't know if it would be needed or not, but just, you know, maybe some sort of mention that, you know, again, the March 1st one might look slightly different or something, or you can just, we can just say, you know, that you know, those are specifically the slides from, from today's meeting. Right. And the meetings will always look slightly different because we have different people showing up and asking different <laughs> questions. And, you yeah. know. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to do that reflection. Um, so our virtual learning um, versus school closure during inclement weather. We're asked to put this on the agenda. So Jamie, do you wanna take the lead on that? Yeah, I, I can just speak to the decision-making process that went into it. Um, we originally were planning to go with virtual learning days um, if we had uh, uh, inclement weather day. Um, and the feedback that I received in general, um, both from some teachers, um, but also uh, students and from community members was that they didn't really appreciate that approach. And so that they were preferring to have a traditional snow day. And I also heard from some board members about that at the next SU meeting after I had made that decision. And so, I weighed that um, information and then also thought about uh, kind of my own personal experience um, with my partner's children who have had virtual days on inclement weather days. And I can't say that um, necessarily I was really pleased with the engagement levels um, that were happening in the, 
in my own personal um, experience with my partner's children. So um, I took that into account too and decided about if we're looking at uh, trying to fill gaps with re regression um, in regards to a recovery plan that I would, um, that I value students being in the classroom for a full day, even if it's in June versus um, a virtual day um, during a snow day. And so um, that's the that's what I use to make the decision to go back to traditional snow days or inclement weather days. Uh, I received positive feedback today, even from some Rudd families who said they were happy that I stuck by the decision, even though that you were already in a virtual mode um, and allowed for a traditional snow day. So um, if you look, we're kind of split all over the place with this decision across the state. Us superintendents can't seem to always get an alignment on how we handle it. Um, Chittenden County, had a, they had a lot of them were traditional snow days in Winooski Valley. Um, I'm the only one that's doing a traditional snow day as a superintendent. And then if you look at the 91 corridor, they were pretty much all traditional snow days. So um, it's a little bit all over the map. Um, I will tell you that um, I think that the positives outweigh the, the negative, the cons or the negatives to go about it this way in the sense of, I really value the fact that we're gonna have students in person um, in June. And I think that's good for our students. And I think that we can provide really high quality instruction in June and uh, in a safe way, because we'll be outside as well, um, like we were in the fall. So those are all things that I took into account to make the decision to go back. And I felt like now it did made no sense, um, even though we had Rudd was virtual, I did not want to confuse folks more. And so that's why we still went with a closure today, even though we were in a virtual mode of learning, um, because I felt like it would just show that you could predict that if there was inclement weather, that it would be a, a typical closure. Um, it was one more stressor, you know, to add to the list of stressors that we all deal with right now that we did have a district virtual when there was inclement weather, but uh, I felt like I just needed to stay consistent and predictable for families. Jamie, I think it's a mental health day for faculty and kids. I'm all in favor of it. Thanks, Mom. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the snow days are good. Um, I do think like it looks like we might have another one on Friday, maybe. Uh, so two hour we, delay at most, Andrew. Two hour okay. delay at most. There we go. Can we do virtual two hour delays too? Yeah, so they would be the same. Yeah, we would do virtual two hour delay too. And I would communicate that. I had it all written out for today. I don't know if you noticed, I, I did get one superintendent to stick with me, CVSU uh, superintendent Suzette Bollard. We, we held out till this morning. We were up at 10 of 5 doing our checks seeing if we could hold out for a two hour delay, but we weren't successful. We didn't feel like we could pull it off. But um, uh, yeah, we would do the same with virtual, Andrew. Yeah, I guess what I would say though, is if we do have too many more, you know, like look at what day you would want school to end, then if we go past that and start switching back. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, Rodney, you raised your hand. Uh, yeah, I, I actually had, Quite a few people comment to me about the, the snow day and it's pretty split uh a lot of people like the snow day idea and a lot of people don't so it's it, it could go either way truthfully um so i had one person that liked the first snow day and didn't like the second one you know so it's like it's, so i i really don't know uh i guess it's i do have to say my own child was pretty excited to have a snow snow day today even though you know it's like she likes schoolwork, but was happy to have the day off too. So, so I guess it's okay either way. Thank you, Lisa. I was also thinking that for the staff, as as Bob was saying, you know, just for our emotional well-being, I'm sure that they could really benefit from having a snow day. So. I know that my kid was really looking forward to it being a snow day, but I was thinking mo more of the teachers and how I'm sure that this would really help them out as well. Yeah, I think with their own childcare needs, um, and in addition to that, 
we're not guaranteed power on a day with heavy, wet snow. Um, and with so much happening in the virtual world, that can be really hard if your power goes out. <clears throat> Once again, with COVID, there are no easy answers for anything, I feel like. But thank you for doing your best in this situation. All right, um, our COVID response is up next. Shane? Hello, um, I guess uh, i give a quick update as to what's been going on in RUD um, since last Wednesday. Um, as Jamie alluded to earlier in the meeting, we did receive a notification early in the evening on the 10th that there was a known po uh, COVID positive case uh, within the school. Um, we immediately uh, transitioned into uh, seven days of, of virtual learning um, because we know that it's gonna take a full seven days to really um, wrap our hands both around the contact tracing and then making sure that those contacts have had time to quarantine and then test out to see if we have any additional uh, positive cases. And with us, with that, um, that seven days would have been up uh, on Wednesday. It being so close to the vacation, it just made sense to uh, extend that through this week. Um, so tomorrow um, will be. Um, seven days since we've closed and um, our contact tracing has gone on throughout the weekend um, and we do have um, some contacts that were identified um, that won't be eligible to test out until tomorrow um, so we'll still be waiting to uh, hear about those test results uh, towards the end of the week and early into the weekend uh, to see where uh, things are at uh, the Agency of Education and the Health Department have reported that we've had five um, total cases um, that were deemed to be infectious while they were in school. Um, so uh, I can say that um, our contact tracing efforts have been really good at predicting um, who those positive, uh, subsequent positive cases were. Uh, and so uh, that's, a, that's a good sign, a uh, positive sign that the systems that we have in place are uh, effective and working as they're designed. Um, we will need more time uh, to really um, see how this situation ends and then be able to get with the health department to do uh, a thorough analysis of, of what happened. Are there things that we could have done better or different? Um, I can tell you, even though the COVID response team has been um, tirelessly doing contact tracing, um, they're not health department officials and we are not privy to and don't have the information that they do. Uh, so it, it's frustrating work. Uh, it feels like we're trying to put together a puzzle with about half of the pieces. Um, and so a lot of the questions that people naturally have about when, where, and how, um, we may never get uh, some real clarity around those answers. Uh, but hopefully um, with time and through collaboration with the health department, um, we'll be able to um, kind of analyze our uh, practices and uh, how things went and see if there are any adjustments uh, that we need to make and we'll do so going forward. Does anybody have any questions? This you are an easy crowd. Uh, this is Lisa. I've got a question. Um, so I'm assuming that Based on the contact tracing, if you think you know who was testing positive, then anybody that they might have interacted with, those people would have been contacted. Is that correct? Like if my kid wasn't contacted, then I don't need to worry about whether or not he was exposed. 
That's correct. Uh, we do all the, um, it's what's called the line list and, and all the contact tracing for people within the school building. Uh, when we when we do those interviews uh, in outreach, we're not um, asking beyond uh, the school day. It's really looking at in-school interactions um, from uh, bus ride, uh, co-curricular activities, uh, and throughout the school day. Um, and I can tell you that we've um, been able to uh, complete that uh, lineless contact tracing and notification. Uh, and we do it generally within about uh, 14 to 15 hours um, from getting the notification of a positive uh, going through all the identification and, uh, and connecting with uh, identified contacts. Uh, and that's generally because we find out um, later in the evening um, and uh, connect with folks um, by the next morning. Thank you. All right, we also have a question from a community member. Um, Shannon, you raised your hand and, and Tammy. It's not public comment, but we haven't had very much public comment. So I'm willing to entertain questions now if that's okay with you. All right, sorry. I, uh, I, it, it pertains specifically to this though. I, I think there's a lot of uh, concern in the community. Um, the fact that there are now five positives, that's, that's certainly new news to me. Can you comment at all on the five positive cases? Are those people you would have, um, that, that would have been found by contact tracing of this original individual? Were there any surprises? And um, can, you contact, can you comment at all on, for those of us who haven't been contacted as parents, I think the concern out there is maybe I wasn't contacted or maybe they just missed my kid. Um, so how do we know that everyone who needs to be contacted is being contacted without anyone telling us, you know, we'd like to know, I think parents out there have been talking about this and want to know which campus was it, which building was it? And I don't think it necessarily um, breaks any laws to give out that kind of information, just the general logistics. We're already saying it's in our district. I don't see why it's breaking a privacy rule to say which building it was in. So can you comment on those things? Well, uh, to your first question, I would say um, that it is possible that we um, have I maybe not identified somebody that would have been a contact. Uh, it's also just as possible um, that uh, these cases aren't actually connected. Um, and so when I talked earlier about uh, trying to put together a puzzle with about half the pieces, uh, it's really the health department and their epidemiology team that needs time to sift through and analyze uh, not only the information that we provide them from the line list, but also those individuals' community contacts, uh, additional exposure risks, uh, and then based on that information, they make a determination as to um, their best guess where transmission occurred. So we're really too early in the process, uh, I think, to um, speak to that. And I really would want to uh, allow the health department to continue to do their work um, and for us to be able to uh, kind of talk, talk through that with them. Um, so, and Shannon, your, the other question you had was? About yes, the, about the, the building. Uh, and, and this is on the Department of Health's website. The, the five cases are all at the high school. So if, you know, folks in the elementary schools and middle school wouldn't have been contacted because there are no known cases there. And, and the decision Thank to you. close all of the Rudd schools uh, is because of really how interconnected the two campuses are uh, with both shared staff, uh, buses, um, siblings, uh, and households across campuses. 
Uh, so it really was important for us to hit that pause button and, and then really to have those next seven days to look at where, where are the contacts uh, and what might be uh, secondary contacts beyond that. So uh, that's why we've gone with the district wide approach uh, and certainly something that, that folks have uh, inquired about uh, when we shut down. And I'll just jump in. We had made a decision as a COVID team um, across the SU after our, our uh, what we learned from Rochester Stockbridge that we would approach this by district um, just because of the just cross, you know, community spread that could occur within the communities, but then also just because folks' anxiety levels were really high. And so it just made sense that if a district had a confirmed case that we would hit the pause button on the entire district and not just the one building. And I do think providing information at the high school would have been useful in that, you know, prevented from speculation or anxiety. You can provide without violating anything. The issue we really had and to just speak to the why is that we didn't know how far reaching this was going as we were contact tracing. And so what I didn't want to do is say it was just limited to the high school when we were suspecting that it could have been further. And then the next day say actually now it's spread to this other campus. Um, and so I wasn't comfortable doing that. And um, and part of that what I criticized in my last dealings of saying was on one campus. And then we found out there was community spread to the other and folks thought I was withholding that information. And so, um, you know, based on what we found out from Rochester Stockbridge at that moment early on, we decided to approach it across the district. Um, because what we ended up finding out was we actually had positive cases across both campuses, but we didn't realize it at day one. And then when we went to report out on it, folks thought we were withholding information possibly. Thank you. Tammy, you have a question? My question is um, twofold. Um, the experience that you had with the other district in our supervisory union, um, you have potentially allowed enough time for the health department to do their kind of, I don't know, root cause analysis. Shane, your words were better than mine. Um, but to kind of look back with clear glasses to identify that. When will we be at that point? Will that be like 30 days out or two months out? No, I don't I don't think it'll be that long. I think uh, towards the end of this week, we'll have a pretty good, a pretty good handle on uh, where things are at. Uh, and then if not by the end of this week, the end of this week over the vacation, um, should be able to really be able to analyze what happened. And, and if there are any additional things that we need to either emphasize um, or put in place. Um, and, and, I, and I say that, and the reality is that we're dealing with a global pandemic. Uh, we have done really well as a supervisory union, as a school district, um, with the level of in-person learning that we have without needing to shut down. Um, this um, isn't necessarily, um, it, you know, we're not going to necessarily find out that there was a smoking gun or, or something that broke down or, or went wrong. This is just um, some of the risk associated with um, COVID. And it's a very difficult um, disease um, because it spreads uh, both uh, from asymptomatic individuals and uh, pre-symptomatic before people start to notice that they have any symptoms. Um, I can tell you that the, the nursing staff has worked tirelessly um, all school year long communicating with family members. And uh, you know the community doesn't know about how many uh, situations were potentially prevented uh, or kept out because of some of our practices and our health screenings and, and things like that. Um, but uh, you know, the, I would say that the community as a, as a whole has done very well at adhering to following the guidance, working together, uh, being responsive, uh, being transparent with the schools. Um, so you know, there might not be a lot 
to learn from this in the end, um, except uh, the the science continues to evolve and grow. I'm hearing um, new recommendations from CDC about double masking and things like that, uh, that we certainly will be looking into. Um, so I think we continue to learn uh, about this um, as we go through the pandemic, so. Great, can I ask another question? Um, the second question is, I'm trying to follow Vermont and um, faculty um, getting vaccines. Um, and what I recognize is that the Pfizer vaccine has a three week period of time between the two boosters. The Moderna vaccine has a four week period of time between the two boosters. And then there's a new one, Johnson and Johnson. Have faculty at all started to receive those vaccines? Okay, um, the nonverbal from Jamie is no. So um, thank you. No, yeah, it's frustrating. Uh, originally, the teachers were going to be higher up on the on the um, like the one B at one point. It was stated in a superintendent's meeting. Um, my sense is that based on the fact that data was showing that school transmission was less likely and more positive outcomes around that data versus community spread they decided to um, not have teachers as high up um, in regards to their order of vaccinating. I also would say though, I think the non-political response to that could have been, they didn't have enough vaccine to know how they wanted to prioritize vaccinating educators. Um, that's my take on it. No one has said that. I'm reading between the lines on that, but I do know part of the issue has been um, inability to access vaccine. I also say one of the frustrations for us around the Department of Health is uh, they we don't get notified of what they confirmed the number is uh, prior to them releasing it. So the first time I heard the number five was confirmed was when the Valley News contacted me this this afternoon. So it's not like we have that information and not releasing it once we receive it. Um, we didn't find that out from the Department of Health, the Department of Health posted it, and we I found that out from media. So that certainly is is a frustration as well around the two-way communication. Um, following up on what Tammy just said, were school counselors able to be vaccinated? Because that's a population that I thought was able to become um, vaccinated. And my hope would be that as they open that up to people that we you know, We've definitely been promoting the vaccine to our our health officials, like our nurses, and I believe that some of our mental health counselors have taken advantage of that and pursued it. Thank you. All right, other questions for Shane Oaks, our COVID coordinator, while he's still here. I'm not seeing any. Um, thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks. All right. Um, next, we have student board member. Um, in the past, we've occasionally had a student board member. Um, so just thinking about whether we want to re-add that position. Um, we did have some students who were coming regularly, but I think it's harder to um, potentially spend a day in remote classes and then off on a remote meeting. Um, at times, so thoughts about that, Amy. Yeah, you know, can I just jump? Reed has allowed me to fill my student bucket a little bit by letting me meet with some of his seniors, and so that's been helpful for me to remind me about why I'm doing the work I'm doing. Um, and so, there's been some students in that group I've been meeting with. Uh, it's actually the NHS, um, who I've been talking about. How do we increase student voice? and what type of strategies could we look to build for structures for the future? And so one of the things, some of them had been student board members, and one of the things we talked about was, you know, as the superintendent, I could assist creating a structure that we could present to boards around the role of the student board member. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we talked about is you know, regular maybe bi-monthly reports that are tied to, uh, you know, some type of school culture and climate plan that they could talk about what initiatives are they taking to increase the positivity across the campus at Rudd. 
Um, one of the other things we also talked about too is how do we increase student voice at younger ages? Um, so the idea being maybe that there's student membership at a middle school level too at some, at some level. Um, and so we also talked about what are the means about who's chosen to be a student board member and having a, a pretty clear um, protocol and procedure for how that happens. So I, I've been able to talk to them and get some ideas. Um, I think that they're excited to share some thoughts that they have later this spring um, and so that they could leave some of these things in place for underclassmen for years to come. Um, knowing that they wouldn't partake in this, because I think Reed, most of them are all seniors. Yeah, National Honor Society seniors. So, but certainly maybe set up some structures as we move forward. So, you know, what I think I'm looking for is some guidance from the board and what Reed's looking for is whether or not the board's willing to commit to um, the idea of like making them have a real voice on the board and some real purpose. Um, and so that's what I was hoping to gauge. And if there's an interest, then in the future, we could bring to the board what the students' proposals were around the role, excuse me, of the student board member. But I didn't want to do that if the board said, ah, I don't know if now's the time to, to engage in that work. So. I'm really interested in that work. Um, I do think the model that we've had where the student board member would come and act in sort of an advisory capacity, um, I just have felt badly over the years for students who look super bored for our whole meeting. Um, so that makes me wonder about some sort of entity almost similar to the facilities committee or the finance committee where their mission is around culture and climate and they report to us, but they don't necessarily have to come to the whole meeting. I don't know what other people's thoughts are, but that's just what my feeling has been for a long, well, not a long time, but the, the times that we've had student board members. And also it feels hard because we have one or two students um, representing you know, the whole student population there um and i would say that we have yet to have a student board member who is not an academic young woman <laughs> not that that's a bad thing um but i think we're more diverse than that I didn't mean to shut down the whole conversation. Uh, well, <clears throat> yeah, I guess I would be inclined to agree that, yeah, I'd like to see like a high school council, like a couple students out of each grade and yeah, and they'd have a committee with, I don't know, yeah, and report. Like you said, it is boring for them just for the, for the whole meeting. And, but if they could just, uh, yeah, come in and, you know, make a statement. And, and then you know they could stay if they wanted to, but I'd like to see it you know for the whole high school, not just you know not just the seniors. I think it could be really interesting to think about. Oh, Lisa's unmuted too. Oh. Go for it. So I was just agreeing that I thought that I liked Rodney's idea, and um, if they came and presented as a representative from their committee then we give them time at the beginning of the meeting and they contribute and say their stuff and if they want to stay for the rest they can but at least they'll feel like they've um, had a purpose for being there that's really representing the student body also think it would be interesting for them to bring ideas for things they think we should be focused on to us um, and then if there was something we had specific questions about um, to make requests of that group. And of course that would be informed by the administration. And I love the idea of a middle level group. I don't know what's possible at the elementary school, but it would be really good. Um, so. One of the things we've been talking about is in order to foster student voice, 
we have to make certain we're setting up the prerequisite skills throughout the continuum of grades, right? Like, I don't think it's fair to just say all of a sudden you hit high school and now you have voice and choice. Like, I think we have to do a better job of fostering it. So one of the things we've been doing a lot of talking about is, is how do we foster that at earlier grades, um, specifically as fifth grade and up through middle school, so that when students get to ninth grade, they're used to having some voice and choice and some control in regards to what happens in their schools. That makes sense. All right, other thoughts on this? Is that enough gonna, information? Okay, yeah. Andrew. Oh, no, I was just gonna echo that. I'm happy to have student involvement in the board meetings. Um, and, you know, you guys can see what structure and stuff makes sense. Right. No, that, that's enough info for us to keep working on. That's great. That's great. Great, thank you. Um, that brings us to the 2019-2020 audit. I'm assuming that's Tara. Yep, I emailed you all the second draft of the audit, so you have that, and now we're just waiting for the auditors to finalize the SU assessments for each of the member districts, and then the final audits will be issued, and then I'll present that to you for acceptance. Any? Taylor, can you give us a timeline on that? My expectation is within the next 10 days, but we'll see. Other questions related to the audit or the audit timeline? Did you guys have any questions about what you saw in the audit prior that we sent you? And if anyone wants to sit down with Tara, uh, Tara, I'm not trying to speak for you, but I know I've heard you offer this to them in the past. Please reach out and then she'll meet with you individually if that's helpful. Absolutely. Jimmy, I haven't looked at the I haven't looked at the school audit yet, but I did look at the central office audit. Have we talked about that? It was brought up at the last meeting, but it will also be on the agenda for Monday for the full SU board. I just want to let the board know, if you haven't looked at it, that you should. And it talks a lot about um, keeping... Um, keeping track of who's working for what grant and how many hours. And if we don't, if we don't meet the requirements of the grant, then we could end up paying it back. Mm -hmm. Just so everybody understands that. And Those are the time certifications um, that are requirement of the grant. And we have put some pretty solid practices and procedures in place. Those are all submitted to me on a regular basis now for review and we are also doing um, at the recommendation of the auditors we are doing a quarterly review of the time certifications to make sure that the staff that are being funded by federal dollars are doing the times that they're supposed to be doing that's all fine and good except in 2020 it didn't happen and that's the problem could be a problem for it could be a problem for us so Right. Just no, you're right, Bob. Those, those procedures were not in place until this fall. Right. Uh, I'm glad they are now, um, but it could be a really costly mistake. Read. Other questions about the audit or. All right. Um, next, the audit is again under action or possible action items. Um, feels like there's some overlap there. Well, I mean, my hope was that the auditors would have the other remaining smaller districts completed so that we could take action on this one. 
Um, but what we're waiting for is the other smaller districts audits to be finalized yeah. to ensure there's no, you know, movement within there that would adjust what we assess you out at the SU for the deficit. So that's, that's why it was there. I was hopeful. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, somebody else want to jump in? Sorry, I navigated away to the agenda. All right. That brings us to new hires. No new hires at this time. That's just a All placeholder right. so we don't forget it. Okay. Um, but I uh, would like to take the opportunity, I apologize, um, under new hires. Andrea, can you talk about Jenny, please? Uh, Jenny has given her letter of resignation uh, and actually has already retired uh, as of a few weeks ago. Uh, she's staying on per diem with us because she's fantastic and doesn't know how to say no <laughs> and helping me through things um, more in this sort of format than in person. Um, so we did do an article in the Herald um, and the climate committee on the South Royalton campus met to talk about how to celebrate her on her way out and the way that she'd feel most comfortable to because she's, I think, kind of a more private person. So, you know, so we put her name right on the front of the school saying congratulations on your retirement. And uh, the kids had a lovely um, send off where we all stood in line the hallway and we called her down to the uh, one of the classrooms. So she thought she was going to help a kid. And then uh, all the t all the kids handed her a, a nice card and we, you know, cheered for her. So it was lovely. Um, so yeah, so she is, we're going to do the rest of the year with just her uh, per diem and uh, have advertised and we'll figure out on filling this position for next school year. That's the plan. Thank you. Um, too bad that she retired. I'm happy for her though, if this is what she chose. Um, thank you for celebrating yeah, that. I wanna just put a shout out. I'm so appreciative that she continued to be there as a support for us. Yeah. You know, one of the things when she approached us about it, I was concerned about is you, it's really difficult to find a high quality candidate this time of year. Right. And so um, certainly wanted to support Jenny's wishes, but also recognizing it didn't make sense to post um, to try to find, a, you know, a long term sub or something. So Andrea felt like she could maneuver staffing around. And with Jenny assisting us at per diem, we can we decided to move forward without filling the position for this current year. Thank you. Lisa, we've had some teachers that have retired um past year that we haven't really recognized or done anything for and um i think about the south Royalton group i don't know about the bethel group um but um i asked reed if he would get a list of those people is he okay. on the one yep he's still here okay say that again Oh, yeah, right. I, I've talked to the other principals about that, and we're working on it. All right. Okay. I think I only knew of a couple from last spring. Um, but, yes, I think it's worth worth recognizing them and making sure that just because they retired during the pandemic, um, they aren't recognized any less than they would have been at a different time. So thank you. Um, so that brings us to our second um, and final section of public comment. Um, I know that Shannon Morrill Cornelius has joined us. Um, she has recently launched a write-in campaign for the open Bethel seat that will be vacated by Rodney Rainville. Um, so Shannon, I wanted to give you an opportunity to um, share a little bit about yourself. I think mostly we're down to people who were on the previous meeting. Um, but I just thought this might be a good opportunity. And also an opportunity for us to say that we haven't heard about anybody running um, a write-in campaign for the, the Royalton seat that Bob will be vacating. So if you know of anyone who might be interested, 
they have to hit at least 30 votes in order to um, be selected as a write-in board member. So Shannon, I, I'll turn things over to you if you want to share. Sure. So my name's Shannon Morrill Cornelius. I was on the board previously, um, and we moved from South Royalton to our permanent home, um, settled in in Bethel. So I had to give up my seat just because I moved over town lines. Um, I, I think I'm Facebook friends with nearly everybody who's still here. So everybody's probably seen, except maybe um, Bob. Um, but I am Facebook friends with your son. So. <laughs> um, but so I have and um, just hope to serve again. Um, so yeah, that's me. And then Lisa, my I guess my question was, since this is still public comment too, if there if I weren't to get thirty votes, or if someone didn't run from South Royalton, didn't get thirty votes, will the board then be asking for volunteers to us uh, to appoint someone? Um, how is that going to look? Yeah, I think, um, and and Jamie or Tara could correct me if I'm wrong because they've been in closer contact with the town clerks more recently. I think. Um, that we would need to ask for letters of interest from people and it would be another appointment if um, no single writing candidate received the or hit the 30 vote threshold. Um, so we would have to start That's that correct. process. Um, and I do think the spelling counts. I wanted to follow up on that. Um, it i think the spelling does count and of of my name so i apologize for having such a long crazy name and also it counts there are two spots a royalton spot and a bethel spot and both of them are vacant um and with no one running so uh, there people are going to in order for me to meet that 30 vote threshold have to spell my name correctly and get it in the bethel spot um so i've been trying to be really clear about that um and especially if you're voting from home this year, um, you can cheat and look at your cell phone. <laughs> to, to, uh, <laughs> I did have one person who said, oh, I'm going to have to remember to spell your name. I said, I think you can take your cell phone into the booth. So right. you could just look on Facebook. <laughs> so, um, but yes, spelling counts, unfortunately. All right. Thank you. Any other questions um, from the public or any other questions for Shannon or for us about the process of our um, election this year? All right, I think that um, brings us to executive session. And I'll just need the board for that. Okay. I would entertain a motion to move into executive session at 7.33 p.m. So moved. Second. All right. And this now, is for um, Actually, we're, we're done after we return. We have to talk about food service provision two um, next meeting, however. Is there any preview of that or we'll just wrap it up? Well, you know, food service provision two is about the ability for students to access free meals um, across campus um, based on free and reduced lunch rates and direct serve rates. And so right now we're providing those free meals based on the USDA um, Summer Food Service Authority. One of the things that we could look at is uh, whether or not we would qualify and my sense is based on our free and reduced lunch rates that we probably won't but i was going to have bill come and talk to you guys about that and that's probably something that will come up in the food service conversation at the su level next week um right. is is where we're at in regards to food service and our free and reduced lunch rates okay thank you um i would entertain a motion to adjourn Okay. Thank you. See you all next. Well, Mar well, we'll be in the full board meeting, right? And then we have our next informational meeting. All right. So we'll see each other soon. All right. Take care. Sounds great, guys.